Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports soccer podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. I'm joined today as always by my colleague and co-host Lisa Roman, broadcaster and analyst for CBS Sports. On today's show, Lisa and I will be chatting about the year-long results of the independent investigation by Sally Yates into U.S. soccer and NWSL reports of systematic abuse. Uh, before we get into everything, a quick reminder to watch all of our Attacking Third episodes, previews, recaps and interviews on YouTube. You can subscribe to our page to get notified whenever we go live at youtube.com slash attacking third. We also want to take this time to issue a content warning on the following episode because this episode will discuss sensitive topics including sexual, verbal, emotional abuse of adults and youths. So let's dive in to what essentially is an update. I wish I could refer to it as breaking news, Lisa, but it's really... Um, an update, uh, a year long independent investigation led by former attorney general Sally Yates working with the law firm King and Spalding um, after last year when over half of the NWSL coaches were separated from their coaching position is why this investigation uh, was launched. Um, the executive summary of reports, uh, ultimately it was over 300 pages, but uh, within the actual reporting of the findings. It's a 173-page report that details incidents, coach misbehavior, and the system failing to protect players by enabling the behavior to exist for years. It's well over 200 interviews of players, coaches, owners, and front office staff from current and former NWSL teams and current and former U.S. Soccer uh, Federation personnel. And of those interviews, over 100 were former NWSL and United States Women's National Team players. And the investigation was ultimately given access to millions of documents from the U.S. Soccer Federation. And about 89,000 were relevant to the overall investigation. Um, I think that just speaks to like the length and the um, intensity of this investigation, uh, some of those stats and the fact that the final the actual report, not including all the details, is 173 pages. Uh, but as you mentioned, over 300 pages of, of overall content um, and documents and retracted statements and everything like that. Um, this this report, it does stem from the results of the 2021 season when so many coaches were um fired, removed from their role for cause. And a lot of the time we didn't have answers to what the cause was. Um, and it's because of this investigation and, and how this was unfolding. Um, but it does focus mainly on NWSL clubs, Portland Thorns, Chicago Red Stars and Racing Louisville with connections to Paul Riley at Portland Thorns. Rory Dames at Chicago Red Stars and Christy Holly with Racing Louisville, who are all former coaches. Um, also, Rory and Paul Riley involved in the youth side of the game. And that's kind of where that touches into this. Uh, but the overall findings basically stated that U.S. Soccer Federation and the NWSL failed to provide a safe environment for players and repeatedly ignored the players' allegations of abuse and inappropriate behavior by coaches over many years. Um, that's the overall results and, and findings of this. Yeah, I think that was part of, um, I think part of the the news, the, the report drop uh, was kind of the reminder of all that. I think, you know, having to come through that was incredibly difficult. I know you and I have chatted a bit about that um, in the in the buildup to this, to this episode. Um, and we've been doing our best to to give you know good mental checks um, on each other because you know within this report there were a lot of things that I think people were privy to already because of the reporting mm -hmm. that came out during 2021. So new details about Riley's tenure with the Portland Thorns or Dame's tenure with the Chicago Red Stars um, had a lot of. Um, you know, uh, details within it that could be found within various reports from 2021. Um, there was new details, though, within this report where you're, you mentioned um, Holly's time with Racing Louisville. 
that was particularly difficult to sort of absorb out of this report because I think partially because it was one of the newer details and uh, just based off of 2021, um, Holly being one of those coaches that was ultimately terminated for cause and the reasonings and, and details of that not coming to light during the time in which he was separated from the club, obviously um, sent off some alarms during a 2021 season where so many things were already occurring amongst certain clubs and certain coaches. Um, so to, we have to, I think, unfortunately operate on the assumption that uh, a player like Aaron Simon's participation in this uh, in long, long investigation uh, ultimately meant that the player was ready, that the victim was ready to sort of come forward and, and, and discuss these things. And that's, um, you know, that's also, I just want to take the time to, to note that that's sometimes how things work out. Um, it really is about, um, you know, the, the safety of, of the victim and the player and sort of having the adequate resources and protections for them. So while, again, there are things within the report that may seem familiar because mm -hmm. of all of the extensive reporting that was happening in 2021, there were still um, new details within this very long report, I think, that were um, eye-opening for a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, there were several things that um, I, I was shocked at, some things that I really had to go back and reread the sentence and fully understand the scope of um, kind of everything that was happening from the administrative le level in the front offices to the coaching staff and owners and then trickling down to the players. Like, uh, for instance, with Paul Riley, um, the reports stating that although these allegations against him of sexual misconduct were brought to the attention of leadership in the league and or the federation, every single year from 2015 until 2021 and and nothing happened until the the public reports from Meg Linehan at the athletic last year came out every single year from 2015 to 2021 this was brought to the attention of people and then in, in the instance with Rory Dames and his um, verbal and emotional abuse and manipulation um, accusations after uh, results of that were brought to the attention of the Red Stars. The the club hired a team psychologist to speak with the players individually. And the psychologist observed that 70% of the players that were interviewed, including starters, players that were starting and playing 90 minutes, reported emotionally abusive behaviors, uh, but that many of those players failed to even recognize that those behaviors were abusive behaviors because they were so ambiguous with women's soccer and, and they just went hand in hand. Um, it, it's findings like that, that really struck out to me because it's, it, there's a difference between um, a tough coach and then a verbally abusive coach. And this report did an excellent job of defining the difference and recognizing that there is intensity in sport, but the behaviors that these players were experiencing, even if they themselves didn't recognize it as abuse, it was abusive to them. Um, and and starting at youth levels with some of these coaches, uh, dames especially. Yeah, it's um, it it gets really really tough when when there's details, new details about how this can stem into youth soccer. You know, you're getting into young young women and, and girls at this point, and you know, listening to you sort of, you know, talk about the the findings of this report, you know, ultimately that, that U.S. soccer and NWSL failed to provide safe environments for players while repeatedly ignoring their allegations of, of abuse and inappropriate behavior, um, you know, with it also defines things, I think, which is also very helpful. This report is very helpful and was necessary um, because it literally defines the fact that what has occurred um over the past decade and and, and beyond um because again a lot of these interviews were were yes current but also past and former players um 
that it's systematic throughout um, women's professional soccer in general has been a place where systematic abuse has occurred mm -hmm. uh, throughout multiple leagues now um, at this point uh, in multiple facets of, of women's soccer, apparently, you know, all the way through, through youth levels. Um, and that's very dangerous when something is systematic like that is incredibly dangerous. It's, it's, it's an environment that was both created and then eventually fostered. And yes. now here we are in 2022 uh, talking about it. And it's incredibly interesting to, to read this and understand there are obviously so many layers to this report and the findings that were uncovered. Um, and, and one of them, as you're talking about right now in terms of the fact that these players spoke up about it. They players repeatedly raised concerns in yeah. anonymous players interviews and through direct complaints to the teams, the leagues, U S soccer federation to uh, try to do this. And, and the reports were either minimized or ignored, or it was said, these players are just trying to put their coach in a bad position. So that's one side of it. These players mm -hmm. were actively trying to remove the evil that was surrounding yeah. them in these systems and, and they were, and they were painted as problems and they were painted as problems. And the other side of that is um, players would speak up and they would be, they would face retaliation yep. from coaches, from owners, whoever it may be. So then there became a fear of speaking up, a fear of discussing this, of coming forward to be seen as a, a player that's just trying to kill the league or a player that's just trying to put a coach in a bad position. And then they would receive a uh, backlash from the coaches and that there are proof and evidence of that. And as this report came out, we did start to hear from players yesterday. Um, yeah. I know Michelle Beto's former goalkeeper for racing level spoke out. Um, I saw video clips of her on Twitter speaking out and she talked about how she felt so guilty as a captain of a team to to not have been able to speak to the players that were going through this because those players felt that if if Betos went and spoke with upper management or the coach, the players then would be retaliated again. So they didn't even tell their captains, their friends, about anything that was happening, um, truly left in the dark and alone. And those, I think that's really the two biggest sides of this, that if they spoke out, nothing was done. They were ignored and they were shamed for that or they didn't speak out for fear and, and because they had evidence that retaliation would happen. Yeah. And it just um, speaks to that, what that quote unquote culture is, you know, within uh, the league and in its clubs uh, that there was a real level of fear mm -hmm. to actually say anything a, Along with the fact that there were not the appropriate um, channels for players to actually come forward with these yeah. results. I think it's a very important part within this report that details the early foundation of the NWSL um, as a sort of joint project within uh, you know, of U.S. soccer and certain ownership groups to sort of come together and, hey, you need to, we need to establish a professionalized league for um, for women's professional soccer. And in doing that, it details in this report how, you know, sort of rushed and it was without those types of protections in place that highlighting the fact that there was not an anti-harassment policy in place until um, 2021 or April of 2021 yeah. for that oh, matter. That's yeah. shocking. Um, you're talking about a league that's already been in existence up until that point for nine years. Um, and all of the misdoings that had been occurring prior to that point, that I think was something else that also stood out in mm -hmm. this report for me. You have this report that's broken down into various sections. We've already discussed how it's highlighted within three areas and certain clubs specifically. Um, but even within each of those particular sections of the report, you see the players struggle in 
wanting to report these things and not having the support system in place or the appropriate channels and avenues in place to go and report those things, learning that they don't have HR report uh, departments. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, a Chicago Red Stars player going to an NW, someone who was involved in NWSL events specifically, trying to figure out how to uh, report uh, Red Stars owner Arnim Whistler. Uh, so that was very jarring, I think, a very jarring reminder of where this league once was prior to 2021. Um, and so many of the things and the details within that yes, highlight a lot of former years, but the fact that there was another player who wanted to bravely come forward and put their name alongside players like Kaya McCullough or Kristen Press or Mana Shim or Sinead Farley and put mm -hmm. their name on record of an occurrence during 2021 specifically, I think also just continue to add in and highlight the severity of this terrible environment that has existed within this league. And the fact that uh, people with knowledge of the abuse of, of situations. So after uh, when, when you look at the example of Paul Riley in particular, in particular him and what um, his coaching career and where that path led to after the results were found at Portland Thorns that uh, he was unfit to coach that team based on reports from players and allegations. Um, they dismissed him as a coach and he went on just a few months later to become a new head coach of the Western New York flash and then ultimately end up at North Carolina courage. So after these results, uh, investigations happened and results were shared in uh, results were, found out individually within clubs, within certain small groups of, of people and things. There was no transparency. So um, when anyone mentioned Paul Riley, it was, yeah, he's a great coach. Instead of actually he was fired for cause, for sexual coercion, for manipulation, for abuse of players. Yeah. And, and that snowballed into um, cover-up effect of – women's soccer as a whole, frankly, because Paul Riley was still coaching and involved in, in youth soccer at that point. So there's just so many layers to this. Um, and, and all of the findings of this report are incredibly long and incredibly detailed and incredibly graphic. And the, the report is out there. Um, it is available to the public to read. Yeah. And if you choose to do so and to read it, I just ask yeah. that you be mindful of your own emotional and mental state um, and, and put yourself first while reading this. Step away if you need to. Talk to someone if you need to, because it is incredibly devastating and heartbreaking and infuriating. I think that's the other part of it, too. Right, Lisa, in, in sort of um, preparing for this moment, I guess I'll refer to it. Um, you know, we knew that this investigation was ongoing. It was launched last year. It was publicly announced that U.S. soccer mm -hmm. had retained the services of Sally Yates in order to do a very, you know, large scope investigation like this. Um, and here we are a year later um, talking about it. And I think part of the build up to that, too, was a, um, was very interesting to note because I think there were some folks out there who maybe anticipated that the public would not have access to this very thorough report, um, that perhaps there would just be um, something small, something shorter that just sort of uh, summarizes um, the very lengthy timeline in which and how this investigation occurred. But ultimately, as of uh, yesterday, Monday, October 3rd, um, that's we now know that that's not the case, that mm -hmm. U.S. soccer... And Sally Yates uh, has give, have given access to this uh, full, again, uh, over 300 page uh, report. So it, it is uh, out there and accessible for people who want to comb through um, all of the lengthy things and new details uh, within it. Um, but something that came out, obviously, of, of this report and the investigations were, were recommendations. Um, as well. Part, part of this investigation and part of this year-long uh, report was so that there would be 
next steps? What are recommendations and next steps to, to come out of these results? Um, and those are highlighted um, within, within this full report as well. Um, some of the recommendations uh, listed are as follows, um, and Yates states in the report that ultimately should be applied uh, federation-wide, uh, not just to the NWSL or to professional leagues. Um, number one on this list of recommendations is transparency. Uh, transparency, A, abusive coaches able to move from team to team, even to U.S. soccer because it was failed to identify misconduct and inform others when necessary. And B, teams should be required to accurately disclose misconduct. And two was accountability. Um, point A, there are no guidelines regarding a team's necessary due diligence prior to hiring a coach. And point B, that U.S. soccer should require meaningful vetting of coaches when necessary, licensing authority to old wrongdoers um, being accountable. The third um, listed, the third recommendation listed is, is clear rules. Um, it says that USSF's policies and procedures are patchwork and that there's no single policy that's going to cover every single organization member or, or govern all types of the behavior that's prohibited within this. So they, they suggest um, adopting a uniform of these clear policies and, and making them codes of conduct that apply to all members and make them accessible in a single location on U.S. Soccer Federation's website. They also talk about player safety and respect, saying that U.S. Soccer Federation and the NWSL should designate an individual within each of these organizations to be responsible for player safety, someone for these players to go to, to talk to that cannot retaliate against these players and will actually take their concerns um, and, and act upon them. Um, there are two final uh, points of recommendation within the report. Seven is discipline. Um, that in light of these findings, results and discipline is warranted. And the final point is um, uh, intersection with safe sports. So about eight um, clear recommendations out of the report to U.S. soccer. Again, uh, wanting it's suggesting that they be applied federation wide and not just to NW solo professional leagues. Um, and and, and youth soccer that mentioning, <laughs> mentioning youth soccer is saying that that soccer federation should collaborate with the youth member organizations um, and take any extra measures that are necessary. And, and with player safety and respect, also player feedback, implementing a system where players can yeah. um, annually solicit and act on player feedback that is reported anonymously. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when, when this all dropped, the, the official report was, um, was was dropped to the public. Um, U.S. Soccer uh, released their their press release uh, linking to the full report, um, but within that also um, listed uh, some some very quick next steps um, in regards to some of the recommendations uh, on U.S. Soccer's website. They say, "quote U.S. Soccer is committed to thoroughly addressing the report's recommendations, and in the most immediate term." U.S. Soccer will establish a new Office of Participant Safety to oversee U.S. Soccer's conduct policies and reporting mechanisms. They also list another bullet point saying publish soccer records from Safe Sports Centralized Disciplinary Database to publicly identify individuals in our sport who may have been disciplined, suspended, or banned. And they will also mandate a uniform minimum standard for background checks for all U.S. soccer members at every level of the game, including youth soccer, to comport with USOPC standards. So um, already trying to um, address some next steps as quickly as they can. Um, I do know that coming out of... Uh, yesterday's big news day, there were also uh, additional media availabilities with Sally Yates specifically and U.S. soccer president Cindy Parlo-Cohn as well. Um, 
and the two of those women uh, ultimately just doing their best to to continue to be open and, and transparent with the a public facing media and a virtual platform. Um, sitting in on, a, on those two calls was very, very heavy. It was very, very emotional. Um, Cindy Parlo Cohn is, is listed within this report as yeah. a former player and former employee of the Thorns organization who went through sexual harassment. And she is now U.S. soccer president and, you know, fielding these questions and, and, and taking these calls. Um, it's, an it's an incredibly tough time, I would imagine, right now uh, for anyone who's a former player specifically or current player at yeah. the moment. Um, and so I'm, you know, grateful that there was the opportunity to, to sort of um, – hear these two women uh, feel any questions. I, I thought there were a lot of great questions from um, our colleagues, uh, Meredith Cash, Cash over at Business Exciter sort of, um, you know, asked specifically about the scope of the investigation that there, quite frankly, were, were teams and not necessarily listed within or mentioned within the report. And um, Yates ultimately elaborating on that a bit, saying that, the scope was very specific in terms of the report uh, because ultimately this report had to end. And that in itself is very heartbreaking um, to know that or feel as if so many wrongdoings in whether it's league wide or in prior leagues or within youth soccer could have made this ongoing and report and investigation somewhat endless is heartbreaking. Um, I believe Meredith Cash specifically asked about club like the, like Houston Dash um, and some of the things that they've been through. Um, Orlando Pride, obviously having Amanda Cromwell out. Um, so important to sort of hear, um, you know, the background on that. And uh, reading reading this report, we, we've talked about it a lot already, at least it's on, on the personal level, how difficult it was to sort of, you know, read these read these new details. Um, you know, but within them, not just hearing about uh, toxic environments and not just hearing about sexual coercion or misconduct, but um, the racism that players have suffered, black players have suffered within this league at the hands, you know, and, and, and miles, quite frankly, of, of some of these former coaches. Um, and that's a different, I think, uh, when we're talking about things that are systematic, there are things that, yes, affect all women and girls within within professional women's soccer. But there are also systematic things that impact black players specifically yeah. and women of color specifically. And you can't necessarily all women those types of moments. Um, and while this is still very new and still very fresh and... Uh, looking at some of the very quick next steps, I had noticed that there hasn't been mention of, of things to specifically offer support to uh, black players and women of color. And it was nice to be able to have a platform to ask Cindy Parlocone about that specifically. So I did ask her that in the, in, in the press conference and that that is something that is on their radar. She said that that is going to be included within the, um, even more uh, next steps that they are going to take uh, moving forward that for now that they wanted to ensure that there were some recommendations that were addressed off the back. Um, but that's absolutely something I think that we need to continue to monitor uh, moving forward. You know, uh, yeah. there was talked about within this report specifically coming out of 2020, some of, some of the trauma that black players, you know, went through and, stemming back from, from the summer of 2020 specifically, but, you know, there's, there's been those types of issues within women's soccer for, for decades, for, for many years, you know, we were on here at one point, um, during July, the summer of soccer of July, promoting, constantly promoting Paramount Plus's documentary with Brianna Scurry, the only, and wow. part of the reasoning that it was called the only was because she was, remembering and retelling her experiences as often being the only black 
uh, woman on some of her teams or within some of these spaces. So um, very important to acknowledge um, at the end of this report that, yes, many things are systematic and there are many things that all of these players have suffered, um, but that there are systematic things that all, that are very specific to specific players. So yes. um, I'm hopeful um, and eager to, to see if there's going to be any anything new uh, that comes out of uh, the next steps moving forward after these uh, investigations, because uh, I think we're starting to see now a little bit players are also now that this report has dropped, it's, it's getting reaction yes. from, from all areas. And that's including players again, still current and former we've seen um, reaction to, to the report dropping. Um, there was a collective statement that was issued um, directly from Sinead Farley Manishim and Aaron Simon um, quote saying there have been too many years of inaction and too many empty promises made while players suffered at the hands of the league. No one involved has taken any responsibility for the clear role they played in harming players not the teams, not the league, and not the federation. They chose to ignore us and silence us, allowing the abuse to continue. It is time for action, accountability, and change. Owners who have driven a culture of disrespect, who are complicit in abusing their own players, have no place in this league and should be removed from governance immediately. This will be the first of many necessary steps to finally hearing our voices and keeping our players safe. So I think it's important for us to always bring it back to the players, right? And the victims of these very terrible things and to sort of make sure that we're highlighting those things. And um, as federations or leagues or clubs are um, finalizing or determining their next steps, it really sounds like the players are leaning in to their next step. And yeah. I think it's important to note that on the show here um they are deliberately talking about ownership at this point yeah i think it's important to note that this investigation isn't digging into events that happened 10 years ago didn't happen before the nwsl yes it is it is digging into events that happened then but it is incredibly relevant. Although Sinead Farley and Manishim and Aaron Simon are no longer involved in the NWSL, they are no longer involved in this league because of uh, the situations that they were involved in and how they were not kept safe and, and trusted. But there are still many, many players and people that are still actively involved in the day-to-day -day workings of the NWSL of individual clubs in the league, whether those are players, owners, GMs, their names are in this report and they are still actively employed by clubs and players that are still actively playing in clubs. And that went on record in this. Um, it, it, yeah. That's the, the thing. It, it spans from before the NWSL and players that are long removed from the league and from ownership roles and from um positions of power, but there are still so many that are still involved and that's happening today that are still involved today as we do this. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I think it's, I think it's another form of, you know, courage and bravery, quite frankly, from the players. It's, um, it's not an easy position to be in to say we are going to ask and state that, ownership specifically uh, remove themselves, you know, from, from governance within the league specifically. I mean, the statement that we just read by Sinead Farley, Manishim, and Aaron Simon, I mean, going back to the report uh, within the Chicago Red Star section of the report, there is uh, a player uh, who states within the report that their participation within this is uh, – to ensure that Arnim Whistler is specifically held accountable, that she wants him removed. Um, so players are, uh, I think, very clearly um, leaning into their next step. And uh, I think that clubs, the league, and the federation um, should rightly take note. So yeah, we'll see. 
you mentioned Arnim Whistler at Chicago Red Stars, Portland Thorns owner Merritt Paulson, still the owner of, of the Thorns and the Timbers, as well as Gavin Wilkinson, who's the, the GM of yeah, Portland. executives. Yeah, who's um, yeah. So the, there's a there's a leaning into uh, looking at, at at people in what were supposed to be leadership roles, mm -hmm. quite frankly. So um, it's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on moving forward because that that's that's the next that really is the next phase of all this, right? The report has dropped. What is going to come of this report, and we will have to continue to to keep an eye on that moving forward. Like Lisa has stated, I'll just remind that the report is public. Everyone has access to read it. Take care of yourself if you choose to go through it. Make sure you put your mental and emotional health first. Um, and we also just want to say thank you. Thank you to the players, um, both named and anonymous within this report for courageously speaking out. And um, we are thinking of everyone who is affected. So with that, uh, we would like to thank everybody for joining us and listening to Attacking Third. Download, follow, and listen to us anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Uh, leave us a five-star rating and review. That really helps us out here at the show. You can also watch us. Subscribe to us on YouTube to know whenever we go live. And Lisa and I will be back with more. We have special interviews. We've got United States Women's National Team friendlies coming up and so much more. For Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.